Hello, Jasmine. Nice to have you. All right, hopefully we'll get a few more uh, as time goes on. And this being the first week, I just put out the link, uh, which will remain for the remainder of the semester. So hopefully we can count on more after this. So uh, it's nice to meet you, Jasmine. And um, thank you, you too. Thank you. And I hope you're doing well. And I uh, have you had a chance to look at the assignment yet? Yes. Okay, good. Good. Do you have any um, specific questions of any sort? Um, yeah, it's on uploading the assignment. Uh huh. Yeah. Um, I have. I haven't used this system before, so I got confused on it. I see. Yeah. Yeah. You know something? To be honest, uh, being from Generation X. I have not been on your side as a student to see just exactly what it entails to uh, to submit an, an assignment. But just what I can tell you is for one, I could uh, reach out to the technology department uh, to, to get instructions from them. Uh, secondly, uh, stay in contact with me via Canvas message. Okay, I uh, actually haven't used Canvas before. Oh, I see. Um, are are you able to navigate just the the message system to go to to inbox and and send a message to me? Yeah. Okay, great. So keep in contact with me via that manner, and okay. I will with you, and um, we'll figure this out together. All okay. right. And Thank in the you. worst case scenario, I had a student at another school uh, who had a problem for quite some time, not knowing quite how to do it, and what he did. What he did in the interim, in the meantime, is he just simply uh, Canvas messaged me and sent his written response as an attachment to his message oh. as a way of getting the assignment to me. So in worst case scenario, just uh, do that until we figure it out, okay? Okay. All right, great. And so remember you have um, from Monday through Sunday night to do each assignment and test. Okay. Uh, as the week demands. And um, yeah, and so uh, hopefully between the two of us, uh, you trying to, um, you know, you, uh, utilize the old trial and error process. And then with me reaching out, we'll, we'll figure out and, and, and being in contact by Canvas message, uh, we'll figure it out together, okay? Okay. But yeah, just in worst case scenario, just in the meantime, uh, if you have to, uh, I know that works because I've had a student do that with me. Just okay. send uh, 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 send me a message from your inbox, uh, uh, Derek Cowell, D-E-R-E-K, and then C-O-W-E-L-L. -L. Uh, if there's not one, just an easy one for your instructor, I, there probably isn't. Uh, okay. Just do it by name and um, and send uh, your, your assignment as an attachment to me if you have to, at least for okay. the first couple weeks. Okay. Yeah. All right. Perfect. Um, well, I'm, I'm glad to have you and um, looking at this assignment, right? Yeah. It's kind of almost kind of disparate, right? Like just different, almost, I, I hate to say almost random because I, there's, there's kind of a method to my madness, uh, mm -hmm. but I, I have it in different categories. And this is what the Spaniards had to contend with um, when they, um, when they, uh, translated the codices, right? The, the codices yeah. or codex singularly uh, were these books that the Mesoamericans wrote, but they wrote them, of course, in hieroglyphs uh, with pictures. And so what they did is people like uh, a priest named Sagun, uh, he went and, and, uh, and was able to accumulate a number of, of, of Aztec noble young men and of course, he had them assimilate. He had them learn the Castilian or Spanish language. Uh, yeah. and, um, and, but they were taught at the Kalmikoks, the, the, the noble schools, uh, they were taught how to, uh, how to interpret each of the hieroglyphs. And so then they would write them out in Spanish. And when you look at them, right, I have, uh, I don't know what I did with my Florentine Codex. Uh, that was the famous one by, uh, by Sagun, but I have here like the Codex Mendoza. 
and they were each of the codices they were um they were named after their main spanish patron who paid for it to happen and so at any rate um they are a bit uh i hate to say random but they're disparate they're they're not in a neat um you know categorical organiza organization uh one picture on one page will show uh Aztec parents disciplining their children. And then right after that, it'll show a warrior in battle. And so they, they're, they're kind of, you know, uh, and I don't mean it disparaging, disparagingly, uh, but they're a little bit all over the place, the codices. So what I try to do is put them into categories, right? Yeah. So we have here, right, according to the codices, the origin of the Aztec, their rise, their famous rags to riches story. Uh, that's in more than one of the codices. Uh, their religion, right? Then also, uh, of course, their mathematics and astronomy tied to religion there. Then you have morality. As I tried to muster things together from the codices. And then you have their hierarchy. All right. And so I apologize if that's not a, you know, as well as I could have arranged it. Uh, but th those were some of the main things that I thought were indicative of, of who they were. All right. And so then you have the three questions to choose from up at the top. Why should present day Latinos be proud of their indigenous heritage? According to some of the data that you see here, you could choose compare and contrast Aztec society with contemporary American society. Or you could choose how do you foresee Spanish Catholic estimation of Aztec society and why? Um, what, what they're going to, to think about um, uh, the Aztec, how they're going to evaluate them. And so, um, yeah, so with that in mind, I want to do, if you'll bear with me here, I want to show a couple things uh, from a PowerPoint that I'd be happy to put online. Remember, this is just supplementary to the assignment. You don't have to look at the PowerPoint. Um, but to me, here are some of the, the, the barometers, the measuring sticks that the Europeans used. Um, I don't see you, though. Oh, do you want me to turn on my camera? Oh, no, no, it's OK. I mean, as long as I could see your name, uh, just even that is fine with me. Um, but yeah, I was just I was scared that I had lost you because I didn't see you. Oh, um, no. I didn't see your name. Yeah, showing yourself, that's up to you. That's completely discretionary and, and that's not, that doesn't make or break anything for me. Okay, there you go. Now I see your name. All right, Jasmine. So for one, right, is, you know, um, what is it? Um, anthropology has a lot to do with this. Um, so does sociology, but especially an cultural anthropology. Uh, they have kind of a, a universal uh cultural evolutionary theory about how society has evolved, right? And so for one, they think, okay, when did someone, uh, when did a group of people in a given area uh, cease to be hunter-gatherers and began to seriously manipulate their landscape? Uh, mainly we're talking about the Neolithic or New Stone Toll or farming revolution. When did they begin farming and, and, and congregating in cities and building great architectural, um, you know, buildings, etc. All right, Jacqueline, it's good to have you. Uh, so yeah, jump right in. Uh, let's see here. I want to make sure I get her name down, so I give you guys your extra credit. So at any rate, we're talking about Jacqueline, the uh, the Spaniards, and how they esteemed the Aztec in Mexico. Um, and to me, it, it boils down to at least these five things. So one, right, uh, borrowing a lot from modern cultural anthropology, they say, okay, how, how civilized are these people? For one, how well did they manipulate their landscape? Did, did, did they begin farming? Did they begin uh, architecture? Uh, did they begin urbanization or city development, right? Then secondly, uh, the idea is, is when you're in a more primitive, and this is very subjective, you guys, uh, keep that in mind. This is the, this is the the measuring stick that the Europeans used, fair or unfair, accurate or inaccurate. And so uh, they look and see, okay, well, usually the primitive people just uh, follow kinship bands, 
right? As small bands of hunter gatherers uh, related to one another as an extended family uh, in kind of a, a, a kin, kinship based gang, if you will, but small group and, uh, and hunt and fish, et cetera. Well, when do they begin to form a society like in a city where that is complex, um, that has farmers, of course, that has fishermen and hunters, um, that has artisans, artisans are skilled workers, right? That make pottery, tools, weapons, et cetera. Uh, do they have merchants that trade uh, with other civilizations? Um, do they have some type of nobility? Because today, right, we're all about egalitarianism, everyone being equal, everyone being on equal footing. Uh, but in anthropology, their idea was that um, egalitarianism, uh, it, at least amongst hunter-gatherers, was, quote, primitive. And so now you have this hierarchy, right, this stratification. And you usually have an aristocracy. Uh, in Greek, aristoi means the best. So a group of people that are kind of uh, there's a sense of legitimacy that the rest of the people in the society ascribe to them, that, yeah, you're our natural leaders, you're the best. Uh, they usually have the, the lion's share of resources as far as land and trading goods, etc. Uh, they have the command to make other people labor on their land. Um, there's usually also a priestly elite, right? Or like, do they get the term sacerdote, sacerdote in Spanish? priest, you have a sacerdotal or a priestly elite, uh, you usually have a standing army. So those are some examples of a, of a complex society. They're also looking for any type of literary, artistic, and scientific development. And the idea is, right, is I, I think of like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, uh, where if, you know, at first, at one, any given time, people may have been in a, in a situation in which they were only desperately concerned about their primal needs, uh, not getting eaten by wild animals, uh, uh, feeding themselves and their children, uh, providing shelter and the basic you know, um, necessities of life for themselves. And, and life didn't become any more sophisticated than that. But the idea is once you began uh, becoming self-sufficient as a society, and, and you, you, you have those basic necessities taken care of, then you start looking at ontological questions, for instance, uh, the, the, the study of our existence, right? You start pondering higher esoteric things like, who are we? Uh, why are we here? Is there a God, uh, et cetera. So then you might engage in you know, music and literature, uh, uh, start writing history of your people uh, for progeny or future generations to be able to read. Uh, that's just it, it's letters. Uh, do you devise some type of, of, of written system of writing? Um, and then, of course, scientific development oftentimes is tied to, um, to number four, uh, technological innovation. They, you know, they, they define the old civilizations by the primary metal that they use, right? You have the stone tool, uh, Paleolithic era, you have the Bronze Age, the Iron Age, etc. So they, they look at the Native Americans and say, okay, how well have they um, progressed technologically? And of course, not just with metallurgy, uh, but with, you know, architecture, uh, farming, um, a myriad of different things, right? But, but looking, and, and of course, military technology. And then fifthly, right, there's no way that the Native Americans could live up to this because they had not been um, acculturated by any Christian civilization. They had, they're, they're separated by the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans, right, in the American hemisphere. And so religions like Judaism and Christianity uh, and the Catholic Church are, are unknown to them. And of course, the, the Spaniards are gonna come with kind of an axiom, kind of a, uh, an assumption that, that is not to be questioned, that there is only one God and it is the Judeo-Christian God, right, of the Catholic Church. And so number five, they're certainly not going to reach that. But with number five, you have uh, practices in anthropology of, of quote, primitive people 
And please note that I put quote there because this is subjective. It's not black and white. Uh, it, it, it's um, at any rate, uh, you have dualism where you have a physical world of the tangible and the metaphysical world beyond the physical realm. Uh, you have shamanism where you have priests and other people who are seen as intermediaries uh, between uh, the spirit world and the, in the natural physical world. Uh, you have polytheism where you believe in many different gods. Uh, so like in Mesoamerica, the God of rain, the God of thunder, the God of the sun, uh, the creator God, uh, all of them have different names and, and are, are known as different, you know, divine entities. And uh, of course, what's not going to go over well, as you see in the handout, if you've had time to read it yet, uh, human sacrifice and bloodletting, right? Uh, to the, to the Judeo-Christian, Roman Catholic uh, Spaniards, that's just not going to uh, be permissible, all right? And so uh, other things that they look at uh, to try to, uh, besides the codices to look to, is they also have a stelae, uh, a stela, right, like in the Near East and Egypt, etc., are these big uh, megalith stones that have hieroglyphic writings on them. Uh, you also have uh, the desire to, uh, to try to use carbon-14 dating right, and try to, to, to gauge by how much carbon-14 has uh, been emitted from a given uh, object, uh, per, per try to estimate how old it is. And they once believed, right, that the carbon-14 dating, that all other variables were, were uh, almost immaterial, that carbon-14 deteriorates and is emitted at a constant level no matter what. But they've, shown, uh, they've subsequently found out that even something as basic as a bar, a barometric pressure and other things could change and alter the rate at which carbon-14 is emitted. So carbon-14 is not a black and white science uh, whatsoever. Uh, they also use stratigraphy. And stratigraphy is like you see in this picture at the bottom where they look in uh, oftentimes, right, with the, the, the laws of erosion, things uh, usually recede under the ground as time passes by. And the idea is, especially if you get lucky and, and you have a level of limestone or some major hard stone, a given period won't penetrate beyond that stone. And so everything that you, that you excavate, that you dig up, you know, 50 feet, 20 feet, uh, from under the ground until it hits that hard stone uh, could have likely, and they look at this sediment uh, as far as the composition of different nutrients and so forth, to see if all of it has a common um, chem chemistry makeup so that they could try to guess and say, okay, I think everything above this stone at 20 feet below the ground uh, was contemporary. Everything that we excavate, whether it's human remains, animal remains, uh, physical objects, right, that they have been found uh, to have uh, lived in the same generation. And of course, there are many variables uh, that go above my head uh, that make it more complicated than that. Um, they do believe, though, however, with cultural ties as well as uh, genetic ties from uh, tests of the 90s. Uh, they still, it, it's not a law uh, as far as, you know, um, its reception by the scientific community, but it is still a pervading theory is that Native Americans, all of them are ultimately Siberian or Central Asian in origin. And so when they did uh, tests in the 90s, they had haplogroups and haplotypes of mitochondrial DNA. Don't begin to understand this stuff uh, well above my head. Uh, but like something as the, the GMAT, the Diego Allel, which seemed to be very rare uh, with humanity, uh, those that if they were homogeneously Asian, uh, who were given the blood test, if they were homogeneously Native American, which is another variable that, you know, sometimes you don't know what your ancestry is, is consists of. Uh, they found that a lot of Native Americans and Asians shared those same common haplotypes. 
And so, uh, but it's still contested. And then, of course, the story of the uh, of the crossing of the Beringia, right? Uh, well, for the longest time, uh, I know as as a youngster, I was taught that in the latest Wisconsin Ice Age era, about thirteen thousand years ago, um, that uh, they traveled across the Barren Sea on a land bridge. Uh, but then subsequent to that, in the 1990s, they found evidence in Chile in 97 that dated objects to 30,000 intelligently humanly designed objects to 30,000 years old. And so it, it, they're far from, it, it, it's, a, it's a puzzle uh, that they're trying to put together uh, of what they know about Native American tribes and their histories, um, et cetera. All right. And um, but please keep that that one particular uh, slide in mind when you're looking at if you choose number three is your question as far as how the um, the Native Americans were evaluated by the Spanish that you might foresee is the these criteria right here right uh, they're largely using that type of criteria to decide how civilized or uncivilized. Uh, the the Mexica or or Aztec and other tribes that they conquered were, and so um, yeah. So at any rate, and then with 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 Mexico, you have of course oftentimes it's contested whether they should be called the mother culture, but the Olmec by eighteen hundred BC uh, had writing knowledge of astronomy. Uh, began arguably the long count Mayan calendar, uh, dealt with the zero with mathematics and astronomy, um, et cetera. So you have San Lorenzo, La Venta, okay? Uh, then you have, you know, Mixtec, Zapotec, of course, the Toltec were highly estimated by the Aztec, and, and, and not to mention, of course, the Maya. In the Maya, you have here uh, Chichen Itza, Tikal, Palenque, uh, the Patan Pen Peninsula. Um, have either of you had a chance to travel to Guatemala or, or Mexico to see any of this stuff? No. Yeah, and unfortunately, neither have I. I, I spent a, a winter term in college in Saltillo, Coahuila, uh, but that's in Northern Mexico beneath, next to Chihuahua beneath, um, Texas and nowhere near any of these famous uh, quote ruins and uh, my goodness I would sure love to um, and then of course in addition to some of these major cities uh, was uh, Teotihuacan uh, known as the city of the gods with the mythology of the Aztec of the Mexica um, they uh, believe that the the four cardinal gods of the four cardinal directions uh, met together on earth in Teotihuacan itself, hence the term city of the gods, and uh, created um, the present um, uh, fifth set of people, because they believe there have been four creations and four destructions up until now, and they foresee that the final fifth will end with a cataclysm of earthquakes. Uh, so at any rate, going back to the, I'm going to go ahead and go back to um, the assignment itself. So with number one, you just get the famous story, the rags to riches story of, of the Mexica or Aztec. Uh, their name meant harmony uh, in the Nahua language. Uh, so everything was about that, uh, about keeping the forces uh, they believed, right, that in addition to the four cardinal directions of northeast, south, and west, that in the center of the earth as well, there were great cosmic trees, hollow trees, uh, connecting the realms, the 13 realms of heaven uh, with earth, and then in turn, the nine realms of Shabalba, or the Aztecs call it uh, uh, Mictlan, uh, the nine underworlds. And they believe that cosmic energy is constantly flowing back and forth through those hollow trees, those cosmic trees. And, um, and with that, they believe you, thus goes in the, the notion of, uh, in the practice and tradition of human sacrifice, that that was part of keeping that divine energy going 
uh, making sure there's harmony in the universe. So with number one, you have that famous story, right? So I felt like I felt like that needed to be addressed, regardless of what uh, categories I chose to put the codices into. All right, so take a look at that. And then with their religion, right? This is tied to values. Uh, but notice, right, is for one, it's called anthropomorphism. It's just a fancy word for ascribing human attributes to deities, to divine beings, to gods. And so oftentimes their gods, right, were, were like the, like the Greco-Roman gods, right? They, they were um, liable to succumb to all the basic instincts, desires, emotions, uh, and faults and vices that humans were. So you have a lot of, you know, uh, trickery and betrayal, uh, murder uh, amongst the gods, um, uh, a lot of jealousy, uh, like the four, the four sons before this, right? According to the Aztec, in at least two to three of those four, um, one god was jealous, was, uh, was envious over the creation of a rival god, and he spitefully, therefore, uh, brought about a destructive end to the creation. And so uh, that's common in a lot of non, uh, non-book religions. When I say non-book, I'm using kind of a Muslim term. Uh, books that have one sacred, um, religions that rely upon one sacred book as a, as a and believe in one sacred God. Uh, so like Islam, Judaism, Christianity, etc. Uh, if you're interested, I, as far as looking at some of the sources of creation and mythology, uh, there's Popol Vuh, uh, P-O-P-O-L, and then separate word V-U-H. There's Chilam Balan, uh, C-H-I-L-A-A-M, and then B-A-L-A-N. Uh, those are the, the written codices of the, of the Maya as far as uh, the creation, the four different worlds before this one, drama between the gods, etc., and uh, kind of like the Romans did with the Greeks, uh, the Aztec are going to borrow a lot of it uh, and make their own uh, derivations of it. Uh, so oftentimes, right, like um, uh, Chalk, the rain god, was renamed uh, Tlaloc, uh, uh, Quetzalcoatl, uh, the, the famous feathered serpent god, had a different name. Uh, that was addressed by the, uh, I want to say maybe Kukul Khan, but I might be mistaken with my memory. Uh, but, but at any rate, it's interesting stuff. So you have anthropomorphism. So needless to say, when you look at number one, right, the, uh, the Christian Spaniards are not going to look kindly on that. They're going to look at it as primitive and, and man-derived, right? Because of course, their Judeo-Christian God is depicted in the Bible as being completely I don't know about completely, right? Because you can make the argument that in the Bible that God created mankind in his own image, uh, but also very much a sense of otherness, holiness, uh, a difference, a key difference in makeup uh, between God and his creation uh, among the Catholics. So uh, you have that, right? And then I go over the, some of the basic stories of the creation, followed by uh, the, um, the ending of the world. And there's a fancy word that I don't recall, but it, it, it sometimes right with mythology and religion, um, you try to explain the way things are now, uh, right. Uh, by way of, of, of your myths and your stories that you perpetuate. And so there's a lot of that in Mesoamerica as there is everywhere on, on earth. Uh, with different uh, mythologies. And so, um, you know, you could, you could talk about the, you know, the creativity of this religion. Uh, you know, some of these stories and some of their explanations for how things have ended up the way that they are, uh, et cetera, right? Uh, so I think of like, what was it, the, the destruction of the, of the wooden people by water uh, in one of their stories, uh, the survivors became monkeys. And that's their explanation for monkeys today. Uh, it's probably a poor example and it's kind of a superficial example, but it's the first one that came to me. Um, so let's see here. Uh, 
So you have all this, uh, let's see here. Perhaps owing to Aztec high regard for courage, sacrifice, and acknowledgement of the fact that life entails a duality of vice and virtue, the Aztec believed that soldiers killed in battle, women who had lost their lives giving birth to children, uh, it was interpreted as having been killed by their war, warrior child in the womb, and sacrificial victims ascended to the high sun heaven after death. So I find some similarities the more I read about the Mexica or the Aztec uh, with like, um, you know, Tokugawa Japan. Uh, so much of it was about uh, stoicism, uh, accepting the, the, the negative parts of life, uh, namely suffering and death, uh, just embracing it uh, with, with courage and um, equanimity equanimity right is that you you uh you keep your composure you don't debase yourself you have good self-control and in good balance uh emotionally and psychologically when everything around you is falling apart uh so you you see that so much was about honor uh honoring your own family name honoring yourself right um dishonor in some ways it, you could almost it, it equate like with Tokugawa Japan uh, that famous expression of death before dishonor especially as it pertained to sacrifice and dying in battle for men um, it, it was it was culturally esteemed in those cases to die valiantly uh, than it was to live in shame and so speaking of that we're going to get to that soon with values all right uh, let's see here then number four, it talks about their calendar. So they had a 360-day calendar with five days of ill omen. Uh, so hence a 365-day. And technically, right, it's supposed to be 365 and a third or a quarter, right, because of leap year. Uh, so they were just a tiny bit off. Uh, but they had that. Um, they had uh, it mixed with a 260-day ritual calendar. Uh, notice with the, the famous calendar, there was a pictograph of an animal, a creature of some sort, a number. And then there was also a, a, a phonetic sound. And the three of them, right, almost like three, um, three dice uh, that you roll, right? You can get a six, a three, and a five, anything from one to six on all three. And so there are a lot of combinations that could come from those three categories. And so hence, right, from that, it, according to my source, uh, 18,980 possible combinations uh, in, this, uh, in this bundle, as they called it, uh, of, of the calendar. And so you notice, right, with the numbers, a line is five years, a dot is one year. So you see two, like 11, it's five, and then five above it, making it 10, and then one dot above that, making it 11. When it's at the bottom, you take it at face value, then when it's on the second ascending, so you read from bottom to top, uh, the second ascending level, uh, you add the numbers together, the bars and dots, and you multiply it by 20. Then the third level, it's 20 times 20 or 400 and so forth. So very versatile, useful uh, mathematical system um, and um, calendar uh, that the Mexica or the Aztec had and largely inherited from the Maya. And the Maya's heyday was virtually about like 200, 250 to like 900 AD, uh, according to the Christian European Gregorian calendar. And so, uh, you know, very impressive. Uh, I say, I think to say the least on number four. And then number five, I don't know if you've had a chance to read this, but it's so sad. Uh, this is the story according to the, uh, the, the workings of, of priest Bernardino de Salagún. I did my best to translate it uh, as a gringo who learned Spanish in school and a couple semesters abroad. Um, uh, I'm rusty, uh, but I like to think that I could decently read it. Um, so I kept the original Spanish just in case I, I didn't do it full justice. But above it, right, it talks about children being sacrificed uh, to a rain god. And there was crying everywhere right? Uh, but nevertheless, they went through with it, and they would, they would rip out, uh, arrancar, right? They would rip out the hearts of these poor children, and it was seen as an omen when they cried 
that that was reminiscent of the falling of rain and fertility uh, that would come to their crops. Uh, but you have the, the a description of the event and it's heart, it's, it, it's heart rending. It's, but, but look here, right? La culpa, the blame, right? Of this seguridad, of this blindness should not be imputed upon the niños or I'm sorry. Yeah. Upon, uh, when uh, those who uh, executed the Ninos should not be imputed upon the cruelty of the parents who with many tears, right, uh, falling and with great pain in their hearts uh, executed them, but to the cruel hatred of our ancient enemy, Satan, who with malignant astuteness or shrewdness persuaded them to do such an infernal deed. And so you're going to get a lot of um, paternalism on behalf of the Spanish, uh, whereby they're going to say, hey, we know the correct God, you're, you're not aware of him, and therefore even the well-meaning Spaniards like Bernardino de Salgun, uh, even Las Casas for that matter, uh, who became known as their defender, as we'll get into a little later, uh, of the Native Americans as a Spaniard, uh, they still uh, were um, proponents of forcing the Aztec to convert. Uh, to drop their religion, to drop, of course, their human sacrifice, and to become Roman Catholic Christians. All right. And then look at this quote, right? What some people do when they look at Aztec morality, right, is they look uh, at a future word that they're going to use uh, for uh, Latinos, is that they're a product of syncretism, right, uh, of two different people with two different cultures blending what they practice and what they know and what they believe, right? And so in some ways, the Aztec religion, despite, of course, the obvious anomaly or thing out of the ordinary uh, of them committing human sacrifice, uh, were, was the fact that some components to their moral code uh, transitioned well, they transitioned smoothly into becoming by force, basically, uh, without their choice, usually, uh, Roman Catholic Christians. So look at like this quote here, virtuous Aztec are obedient and honest, treating their fellows with respect and showing discretion in their dealings, right? So discretion is a good broad uh, noun, right, of just propriety, uh, doing the right thing, not just when people are looking in their dealings with others. Virtuous men and women work hard, so diligence, right? The Spaniards were all about that uh, in, in their culture, uh, whether in the fields or at sewing, preparing food in an artisan's workshop or the marketplace. They bring energy to their work without overindulging in sleep, right? So the, the, the seven deadly sins and sloth, right? And, um, and overindulgence. Uh, let's see here, uh, overindulging in sleep, but rising early and laboring for long hours, they eat and drink in moderation. I think of Aristotle being embraced from the scholastic movement of the Catholic Church in the medieval time period, uh, whereby, you know, he said moderation in all things, right? Uh, not being excessive, having self-control. Uh, drunkenness is particularly frowned upon. They do not make a great noise when eating. Uh, they're circumspect. They watch very uh, acutely uh, in what they say. So they, they hold their tongue. And of course, that's big amongst, you know, in Christianity as well. Uh, they dress and behave with modesty, right? And so uh, they, um, that modesty was huge amongst the friars and the, and the priests of the Spaniards who came to convert the Native Americans. So children are, are reared or raised to understand and follow this code. And, you know, they had a notion of something that was pretty close to sin. And they had different gods, depending on what type of sin that you had committed, uh, different gods that you would go and do penance with, which involved, like I said, in some cases, bloodletting, uh, cutting your own ears and cheek and lips and other parts of your body uh, as, as penance. Um, of course, they had a notion, right, of heaven and hell although they didn't really waive it entirely on how you lived, a lot of it was dictated upon how you died. Uh, certain heavens 
certain levels of heaven just for those who died in war or giving childbirth, uh, etc., uh, or drowning, etc. So let's see here. She told him that it life was all affliction, travail, and would befall him on earth, and that he would die in war, would die in sacrifice to the gods. So that type of stoicism or fatalism about life entailing so much suffering, that's going to go on, that's going to go along very fluidly uh, with the early modern, just post-medieval Spanish worldview, right? That life is meant to be uh, tough and, and sorrowful. So let's see here. And then, of course, with number three, I, I think of, um, of the Beatitudes of Jesus, right? Uh, blessed are those who, who mourn. Blessed are the humble. Blessed are the meek. And so you find that in the writings of the Aztec. So like I said, you know, notions of divine punishment for sins and doing proper penance. Uh, notion of noblesse oblige, uh, the nobleman's obligation, that the higher station you're born into, the higher standards you ought to live up to, as an example to the poor commoners. Uh, a lot of different things that, like I said, mesh well uh, with the Roman Catholic Spanish uh, worldview. So you have that on number three. Um, and like I said, that makes me think of the Beatitudes of Jesus. Blessed are the lowly, blessed are those who are suffering now. Um, and then again, moderation and discretion with number four. Uh, if you are incorrigible, like where you get the, the, the Spanish verb, corregir, right, to correct. Incorrigible, you're, you're, uh, you're, not, you're not willing to be corrected. You're stubbornly, defiantly um, deviant, uh, deviate away from what you're taught as right and wrong. Um, negligent, uh, idleness, right? So we talked about those things. And then again, there were severe punishments. Uh, so again, the notion of like with number seven, um, but also, right, uh, with five and six, you'll notice that there is a hierarchy of uh, the Aztec society was patriarchal, but I would make the argument which society was not patriarchal. Uh, in the 1400s, like in their heyday. Um, but also there, were, there, were, there was a lot of care and concern for protecting the reputation and the well-being of the young Aztec women and to make sure that they were not mistreated. And so you have that. Uh, with number seven, again, so much about honor. That was a severe blow culturally uh, to have your hair cut as punishment. Uh, you could be flogged, uh, look here, lying, theft, treason, uh, incurred the death penalty. Um, not so much lying, uh, but the latter two, I would include that with the Spanish. You got to remember, this is the early modern era. Uh, this is not today. Uh, they had a system of judges. And notice, right, with these noblemen judges, they were to be impartial. They were to be impartial in their decisions and not side with the wealthy, the nobility, uh, the pipit lean over the commoners. Um, and so there was a sense of integrity uh, that the noblemen were supposed to exemplify uh, in Aztec society. So much was about honor. Uh, in Aztec society, members of the army were respected as paragons of courage and fortitude. And if they had success in battle, uh, they, they could um, accumulate certain privileges that were not available to the rest of the Aztec people. So hence, you know, an aristocracy, a military aristocracy uh, existed. And so they could marry multiple wives, they could drink the pulque alcoholic drink, they could wear certain garb that other people could not wear, they could be a part of the mighty jaguar or uh, an eagle warriors, uh, these kind of, you know, uh, high marine type uh, bodies of the institution of the army. And then look here, the emperor himself as part of his coronation ceremonies had to lead a military campaign to prove that the gods blessed him in battle. He had to do that immediately upon being enthroned. But again, before that, he had to humble himself. He stripped himself down to a loincloth and did public penance for everyone to see him in humiliated fashion. 
uh, that really reminds me of, of the Spanish Catholics. Um, uh, and then at the proper time after his coronation, then he could live in great splendor and have the greatest of food and servants uh, and amenities that other people didn't have. Uh, he kind of like early modern uh, Spain, he was the technically the, the uh, in addition to the ruler, uh, it was uh, Tlatloni, uh, he who speaks. So the great speak maker was the name of the emperor. Um, and then there were sub Tlatelones uh, that, that he uh, oftentimes handpicked or sometimes were, had their own local aristocracies in the regions in the Valley of Mexico. Um, but, but again, they, they had a martial culture. They had a military culture for sure. Uh, death before dishonor. It was an honor to be captured as a prisoner of war and sacrificed uh, to one of the, the primary gods. Uh, the the, mili the um, emperor had to be a great military leader as far as having kind of like what the Chinese called the mandate from heaven, the approval of the gods. So you see with number one, but with extra privileges and power came responsibility. Punishments for crimes were more severe for noble suspects than for commoners. So they went to these schools, these noble schools. They had an education system, uh, two separate school system, one for the commoners, one for the nobility. This is the name of the schools for the nobility. So notice they learned to read and write. They studied the calendar. They were educated in history, mythology, battlefield strategy, and the martial arts. All right. They lived in two-story homes, etc. And let's see here. Uh, commoners oftentimes were farmers, fishermen, soldiers, or uh, artisans, skilled workers, or merchants, right? Uh, oftentimes they had their own plots of land, especially in the cities uh, they could, they, that they were entitled to, but technically the emperor was the owner of all the land. And so as far as a capitalistic European sense of you owning the land that you own, uh, it wasn't the same. It was more, they call a fancy word is usufruct. Uh, you're not the proprietor, the actual owner, but you're allowed to use that land in the name of the higher power of the emperor. Uh, but really the Spaniards weren't, as much as we look back at it in hindsight today, uh, with you know capitalism developing and private property and private interactions in the economy, uh, the Spaniards weren't that far ahead either. Uh, they, they still had an almost medieval notion of, of feudalism, right, of a lord controlling most of the land, but the lord really was just controlling it in the name of the king, and people could rent or, or stay on that land, oftentimes give labor, and so with the, the Aztec commoners, they had um, several weeks, that's literally the term translated from the Spaniards, they had several weeks throughout the year where they had to go to the local uh, Tlatloni, the, lo the local mini emperor, uh, noble leader, right, of their city state and um, literally work on his land and, and or engage in public works, uh, help uh, with construction and other things for the, for the entire empire. But then the rest of the year, they could tend to their own gardens. They could tend to their own uh, skilled labor, uh, et cetera, as they have found in many houses in, in Mexico. Uh, it, it, um, although it's tough, I don't know how true that is actually, because Tenochtitlan is literally under the ground under Mexico City. But in other places besides Tenochtitlan, they've excavated homes uh, of other cities and have found um, evidence of skilled work, farming, uh, uh, et cetera, trade. So there were certain opportunities and freedoms that the common people had uh, at this time, right? Uh, number four, the woman was supposed to, her place was the home. Uh, the term they used in Europe, right, was separate spheres. Uh, the public sphere is for the man. The private sphere of the home is for the woman. Uh, but again, where was that not like that? Uh, the Spaniards certainly had separate spheres notion and practice and tradition as well. Uh, then you have like with marriage and certain things, right, come from the Aztec and the Spaniards took hold of 
um, here in the Americas that have formed informed parts of, of tradition that Latinos still in some areas uh, in the Southwest uh, follow, uh, such as right a gift given by the elder brother or father of the would-be groom uh, coming to the house and asking for permission um, uh, for the marriage uh, to the, the father and parents of the would-be bride, uh, a certain a lot of time to, to wait and see if something was put at their door. Oftentimes it was some type of, of gourd or pumpkin. And uh, if they said no, and they would smash it and put it on their porch. Uh, and so, you know, certain things as far as uh, traditions with, with marriage, uh, the treatment of young women, like with their quinceanera, uh, they had rite of passage very similar to that at 15 amongst the Aztec. And so uh, let's see here. So the ruling dynasty, those related by blood to the emperor were kind of a class apart. They had the highest position as the highest priests, highest military officers and government leaders and judge positions, etc. right? And that's what you have right here. Several weeks of work each year from commoners they were entitled to. And sometimes they did seem to live as if the commoners existed to serve them. But remember that according to the anthropological data and their, their idea of evolution, that was a, uh, however much we look askance at it now, that type of elitism and, and a hierarchy, uh, according to anthropology, that's a, that's a symbol of being civilized, that type of complexity, right? Um, let's see here. We're almost done. Okay, hang in there. So uh, the emperor was elected by a, a, a group of, of, of chosen elders uh, that were related to him. Uh, and his successor was not inherited as did not inherit it as the eldest son, as happened oftentimes in, in Europe, uh, but was chosen and oftentimes they kept it within the family. Uh, but still, there was an elective process. Uh, slaves did not inherit their status. Often a master uh, bought a would-be slave's debts and paid him or her enough to live off of for up to a year. Subsequently, after living that year with a high life off of nobleman's money and paying off his or her debts, that person had to um, begin work as a, as a temporary slave. Right. And the process was was looked over by a judge and four witnesses. Uh, sometimes they did have a visible wooden collar uh, put around their neck. But again, you know, you look at look at the way that the Europeans dealt with African slaves, sub-Saharan African slaves. Uh, absolutely awful. Inherited by ethnicity. Uh, very difficult to extricate yourself from. So oftentimes for life. Uh, etc. So again, self-denial, self-abnegation, and piety were expected of those who were accepted into the noble schools. And notice, right, it wasn't just nobles. It was commoners' kids, commoners' sons, uh, if they showed great promise uh, militarily or religiously, uh, they, could, um, they could go to the noble schools and rise up the ranks, so to speak, in limited to a limited degree. And those same two avenues of socioeconomic mobility, of moving up by merit, by achievement, uh, were present amongst the Spaniards, right? Uh, the military and the church were the two main institutions, and the Aztec were no different in that respect. So you definitely have differences, but you have a lot of similarities uh, between the Aztec and the Spaniards. All right, uh, let's see here. By the age of 15, most village and city commoner kids lived in dormitories uh, where they trained for war, learned songs and dances pertinent to Aztec religion and holidays, where they learned artisanal skills or skilled work uh, related to public works. All right. And then number 12 is that what I've tried to get to with number 12 is the Aztec made enemies, especially those just outside their empire. Because kind of like the Romans, uh, the Aztec, when they conquered you, they allowed you oftentimes, as long as you paid tribute to them 
in, in, in the form of certain goods that were highly coveted by your region, in your region, and made by your people. Most often, it was some form of textile or cloth made object. Um, but as long as you paid your proper tribute, uh, you were allowed to, um, to keep your rulers and keep your own basically law code uh, and have semi-independence, semi-autonomy uh, under the Aztec. But those outside the realm, right, they were subject to what were called flower wars uh, because of the flowery garb that the warriors would wear. And, and there they would, uh, sometimes in the flower wars, they would just begin a battle, begin a war, simply for prisoners of war to be sacrificed uh, as far as, uh, you know, human sacrifice. So they made some enemies, especially people like the Tlaxcalans. Uh, in the future, they are going to be, um, they're going to ally themselves with the Spaniards and turn on the Aztec. And they were nowhere near the only tribe that did so. So it helped bring about the undoing of the Aztec Empire. And then with this, uh, this section down here at the bottom, right, I'm saying in so many cases, uh, the Europeans tried to justify uh, what they did by contending that, um, sorry, um, the, the Aztec tried to contend what they, or the, the, the Spanish tried to uh, justify taking over the Native Americans uh, by contending that they were bringing civilization, right, uh, to the Americas. So they like to depict uh, those who wrote chronicles, uh, Europeans who came to the Americas and wrote about the Native Americans. Uh, you know, they had a very Eurocentric eye. They were seeing from their own perspective, from their own culture, their own society, their own time period. Uh, and, and so they, a lot of people contend that they couldn't give an accurate account of the, of the Aztec if they wanted to. But then further than that, oftentimes they said they didn't want to anyway, right? Because you come in and take someone else's land. You take control of them. That's one of the common historical justifications for doing so, right? To help you sleep better at night. As well, they were primitive. We're going to help them that whole paternalism thing, right? We're gonna bring civilization to them. We're gonna convert them to good Christians. Uh, we're gonna teach them. We're gonna bring them a uh, proper uh, legal system in writing, in culture, uh, et cetera. And what I contend here in this last section is that that was a farce. Uh, the Native Americans, uh, and not to mention, they also contended that, that um, of course, the Spanish couldn't with the Aztec. They couldn't deny the population density there. But in other areas, right, they contend, well, it was scarcely populated anyway. It was tierra vacia, right? It was, it was empty land uh, that we were able to grab. So at any rate, um, I contend in this last section that that's simply not true. There were millions of Native Americans in the hemisphere. So they were here first, uh, claiming and inhabiting the land. It wasn't empty land to be taken, and that they were, according to the America, the Spanish barometer, the European measuring stick for deciding how sophisticated they were, with the exception of religion, which they didn't have a prayer of meeting the criteria, right? Because again, they had never been subject, they'd never known about Christianity uh, or the Catholic Church. Uh, but besides that, as far as the development of a farming revolution, uh, a written system, Tenochtitlan had petting zoos, had libraries. Um, uh, it was below, it's below sea level. And so they had a, a sophisticated causeway and canal system going in and out of the city. They had the famous chinampas or floating gardens, uh, which were qu quite impressive uh, as far as subsisting uh, on corn. Uh, etc. They had a very um, intricate and elaborate trading system with people all throughout. Uh, you know, you they have found Aztec products in the American Southwest, right? Uh, in, in present day New Mexico and Arizona, etc. Um, so yeah, you have, and then of course, not to mention their famous, uh, you know, architecture, uh, the Great Pyramid in Tenochtitlan, 
the Pyramid of the Sun uh, in Teotihuacan, uh, Chichen Itza, Palenque, and the other Mayan ruins, just impressive uh, architecture. And then, of course, a sophisticated system of mythology and religion, uh, of, of stories explaining how things are today or why they are the way they are today, uh, their knowledge of mathematics and astronomy. They're really big into the planet Venus because Venus disappears for some parts of the year. And they believe that that's, that goes along with the time when Quetzalcoatl, the feathered serpent, uh, went down into the underworld uh, to get bones of a previously existing humanity uh, to come back up and create another human race. And, when he, um, and then he eventually rose back into the sky as the planet Venus. Um, so yeah, you have all this uh, as far as the Aztec. And so I'm, I'm defending the Aztec obviously, uh, and other Native Americans as far as creating complex societies and, and hitting that criteria that I went over at the beginning, those five major criteria uh, on slide 21 of the PowerPoint. So ladies, how are you doing? You have any questions? Are, are, have you been able to hear me? Uh, can, I, can I have someone uh, you know, unmute or at least give me a thumbs up? Thank you. Okay. Um, so far, I have no questions. Okay, great. All right. And so, you know, I'm not that impressed with the questions that I offered one through three. I mean, between the three of us, if you had a, a, a better theme, a better uh, question to address, uh, you could do your own thing. My Primarily with me, right, is I want you to be able to marshal data that you come across and then critically think and form some type of a thesis, some type of a main argument uh, utilizing that data that you've come across. And so you don't have to engage in extra research. Um, of course, if you wanted to go above and beyond, it's something that's not covered on this handout, then great, the more power to you and perhaps the more you know, extra credit points I might give you, but you're certainly not asked to. So just with the data that you have here and from that which I have tried to lecture, um, use that as your raw material uh, for addressing some type of, of, of question, okay? All right, so each week, right? So I have here Zoom one, Aztec assignment. So you two ladies are gonna get five to 10 extra credit points added to your raw score out of 50. Uh, on this first assignment, and I do it each time. Most of the time I give five, uh, but trust me, you, you come regularly, that five is gonna put you in a position whereby when you take tests two and three, you have um, some, some wiggle room, you have a, a safety net, so that if you, know, you happen to not test very well and get a little bit lower score, those extra fives add up and help pad that, that test score. So uh, please, by all means, I'd love to continue to see you on Tuesday afternoons. Uh, thank you so much for attending. And we'll go ahead and call it a day, okay? Okay, thank you. Thank you.